Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here again. After I think last time I came here, it was something like 10 years ago. Okay, I'm going to talk about Hamiltonian dynamics. Let me introduce the base setup. Uh, you have R2n with the canonical simplified form given by this guy, which, which is exact, is given the primitive is lambda, is the Liouville form, is lambda. And you have a typical Hamiltonian, right? Class Hamiltonian. It's a proper Hamiltonian, means uh, homogeneous of degree 2, such that the energy levels are compact, are compact, the regular energy levels are compact submanifolds, more precisely, compact spheres. So the regular energy levels, we take k, k is a, is a regular value, so the pre-image, so the, so the, pre the, 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 the regular, the energy level is a star-shaped sphere. The fact that it's homogeneous of degree 2 implies that this level, sigma, is star-shaped, is a star-shaped sphere, <coughs> is a star-shaped sphere in r 2 What means star-shaped? It means that it's transversal to the radio vector field. Okay, so you have the radio vector field here. This is transversal to the radio vector field. Okay? For instance, in the, in the convex case. So you have these spheres, which are the regular energy levels of the Newtonian, and you want, they are invariant by the Newtonian flow. Okay? And you want to study the dynamics of the Newtonian flow on sigma, on these energy levels. Okay. It turns out it's easy to see that the study of this, the, 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 these dynamics, the, the Hamiltonian flow of this star-shaped hypersurface, the, 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 the dynamics is, equi is equivalent to the study of the dynamics of wave flows on the standard contact sphere. What it means? If you take this sphere, the, take for instance the round sphere S to n minus 1 in R to n. Okay? And then you restrict lambda, the Liouville form, to the sphere. Okay? I take the restriction. Let me call alpha is lambda restricted to this sphere. <coughs> and then you take the kernel of alpha. The kernel of alpha, I call this psi, the kernel of alpha. This is, what, this is a, one a dimension one distribution on the sphere. And this is what we call a contact structure. Okay, and now take any contact form, one form on the sphere. Let me call alpha beta. Take any take any one form on the sphere, such that the kernel of this one form is this psi. Okay, so you take the sphere, the round sphere, and now take the restriction of the Liouville form to the sphere, and then you take the, the kernel of this, of this restriction, of alpha, and you have this distribution, it's a contact distribution, and now take any one form such that the kernel of this one form is psi. Of course, lambda is, is such one form, but you have a lot of possible one forms that satisfy this condition, okay? And now associated to this one form, what this is called a contact form, Okay, you have a canonical dynamical system. It's the rib vector field. It's uniquely ca characterized by the following two conditions. The first condition is that, let me call this R beta, is that the contraction, the contraction of the differential of beta is zero. So R beta is in the kernel of differential of beta. And the second condition is a normalization condition. Namely, that beta applied to, the, to, the rib, to this vector field is constant equal to 1. This is called the rib vector field. So associated to, it, to any contact form, beta like this, that's fine, this condition, you have this canonical dynamical system, okay? And the study of these rib flows, of the flows of these rib vector fields, 
is equivalent to the study of the Hamiltonian flows like, like this, restricted to these energy levels. OK? Is it clear? OK. OK, we, we, we want to study the dynamics of these wave flows, of the Hamiltonian flows on sigma. And if you want to study dynamics, the dynamics, well, of course, the, 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 since the, regular, the energy level is regular, you don't have singularities. So the most basic ob dynamic objects are the periodic orbits. So if you want to study dynamics, you, you look for the first thing you want to look for, you want to, 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 to look for are the, are the periodic orbits. OK? And the key point, and the key point is that these periodic orbits in the Hamiltonian setup, in general, if you have a flow to find periodic orbit, it's something difficult, right? You don't have something to start with. But in the Hamiltonian context, you have something very useful, which is the fact that critical uh, periodic orbits are critical points of the action function. You have a variational structure behind the periodic orbits. More precisely, what you can, you have the following. So you have this Hamiltonian, and associated to this Hamiltonian, you have the action functional. What is the action functional? You consider the space of closed curves with fixed period, T, okay, in R2N. And you associate to this space of, of the, uh, to, you have a, a functional on the space of these curves, which is the action functional associated to the Hamiltonian, which is given by this. It's the integral of lambda. Lambda is the primitive of the symplectic form. It's a divided form over the closed curve minus the integral of the Hamiltonian along the closed curve. And it turns out it's a, it's a classical fact that the periodic orbits are critical points of this function. So we have, as I said, this variational structure to find periodic orbits. OK? OK, so now denote by P the set of simple periodic orbits on sigma. Simple means the following. Of course, whenever you have a periodic orbit, if you have a periodic orbit, then you have actually infinitely many periodic orbits. Why? Because you can take the iterates of the orbit. They are different orbits. Okay? But the simple means exactly that uh, it's, not, it's not the iterate of some periodic orbit. Okay? Simple means it's not the iterate of some periodic orbit. So they're not by P the set of simple periodic orbits on sigma. We say that sigma is non-degenerate if every periodic orbit, including the iterates of simple ones, are non-degenerate. Are non non-degenerate non means the following. It means that if you take the first return map and you linearize the first, you take the linearized Poincaré map, the, the, the linearized first return map, it does not have eigenvalue 1. OK? A periodic is called elliptic or stable if every eigenvalue of its linearized Poincaré map has modulus 1. Okay? Under generic conditions, why elliptic orbits are important? Because under generic conditions, uh, the existence of elliptic periodic orbits implies a rich dynamics. You have positive topological entropy, and well, you have a lot of, you have very rich dynamics under generic conditions. And denote by PE the set of simple elliptic periodic orbits. OK, so I have a P is a set of simple periodic orbits on sigma. Sigma is a, is a regular energy level. And PE is a set of el simple elliptic periodic orbits on sigma. OK? 
And the goal of this talk is to study the multiplicity and the stability of periodic orbits on sigma. In other words, we want to get a lower bound for p for, for, the, cardinal, for the cardinality of p and p. This is the goal of the talk. Okay. And there is a classical conjecture in Hamiltonian dynamics. I think it goes back to Poincaré that states that, uh, that you have at least n periodic orbits, simple periodic orbits, on any sigma, and at least one elliptic periodic orbit. One elliptic periodic orbit. This is a classical conjecture. This is very important here, because in general in dynamics, you, look, you consider generic dynamics. Well, in, in dynamics, here in this conference, you can, most of the talks, you consider generic the uh, dynamics in, in, under generic conditions, right? The point here is that we are not considering generic conditions. We are taking any sigma, any Hamiltonian as before. Okay? Under generic conditions, you can show, the, 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 you can show in fact, that PE, you, you have infinitely many elliptic periodic orbits under, gener and, and, under C2 generic conditions. So the problem is, is that we are not assuming generic conditions. We are considering any star-shaped star sphere in our train. And we want to get this lower bound for the number of simple periodic orbits and for the number of elliptic periodic orbits. Any questions so far? Good. Is no, is no. You can f uh, actually what we you, what is known is the following. Uh, C infinity generically you have infinitely many periodic orbits, and C two generically you have infinitely many elliptic periodic orbits. Okay. But if you don't assume general conditions, you do have examples with finitely many periodic orbits. And the the easiest example is given by an, an irrational ellipsoid in our train. It carries precisely any periodic orbits. Ellip irrational ellipsoid is the following. You take an ellipsoid, you take coordinates, you, you, you identify R to N with CN, take com complex coordinates, Z1, ZN, and then an irrational ellipsoid is something given by this. Where R e squared, this R, R i squared are rationally independent. When these guys are rationally independent, then you take sigma given by this equation, then it's easy to see that you have precisely any closed orbits. Okay? The Hamiltonian flow is completely integrable, it's foliated by invariant or i, and you have precisely any periodic orbits. And it's non degenerate. Of course, you can ask why, 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 why? If they are rationally dependent, then you have infinitely many. If they are rationally dependent, dependent you have infinitely many. Yes. yes. For instance, well, for instance, if it's one, for the case of the round sphere, all the orbits are closed. But in general, when they are rationally dependent, you have infinitely many. Of course, you can ask why, the low, why you have this lower bound n? Something magic, why, why, where it comes from, right? Why n periodic orbit? It has a topological meaning, which is the following. Uh, it turns out that, you, so you, take, you have this standard contact sphere, right? This, the, you have this sphere with this contact structure. There is a general construction in simplified geometry called the pre-quantization bundle, which is the following. I can explain you, it's not so, so important in this talk, but I can explain you in, f in few minutes. If you take, it's a way to construct contact manifolds from sympathetic manifolds in the following way. You take some sympathetic manifold, B omega, and you assume that the cohomology class of omega is, a, is, an, uh, is an integral cohomology class. Okay, so you assume that the cohomology class belongs to A to B Z. Okay, under this, con under this uh, 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 assumption, you can construct an S1 bundle over B 
there is an S1 bundle over B, okay, which is a, so whose Euler class is the cohomology class of omega, and it's a contact it's a contact manifold. Okay, and it turns out that the standard contact sphere, this is called the prequantization bundle of B, the circle prequantization bundle of B, and it turns out that the sphere is the prequantization bundle, the sphere S two n minus one, is the prequantization bundle of C p n minus one. Okay, it's the, this is the 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 the, the, the circle bundle is, in this case is just a half vibration. Okay, and n is the total rank. Of CPN minus of the homology of CPN minus one. This is the reason why you have this low, the topological reason why you have this lower about n for the standard contact sphere of dimension <coughs> of dimension two n minus one. In general, you, what what you expect is that so you have this general construction. In general, what you expect is that whenever you have this prequantization bundle, then you have at least R periodic orbits, simple periodic orbits, where R is the total rank of B with rational coefficients. And at least one elliptic period, one elliptic periodic orbit. This is what you expect in general. Okay? But unfortunately, sorry, it's far from being known. It's a very hard problem. Even for the standard contact sphere, it's far from being known. Yes? What? So again? No, 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 no. Actually, you, we expect that for the sphere you have at least any elliptic periodic orbit. That's a good point. I, but it's a, it's a harder it's a harder problem. Yeah, but we expect that you have at least. Actually, we actually expect that if you have finitely many, then all of the periodic orbits are elliptic, like in the in the like in the irrational ellipsoid. In the rational ellipse, they have precisely any periodic orbits, and all of them are elliptic. Okay, so let me give you a state of art of this problem, a survey of no results. Now, first, without any condition on sigma, sigma is just a star shaped sphere. Well, without any condition, the first result was obtained by Habenovitz. In 1978, he proved that you have at least one periodic orbit. And it, it was really non trivial because of the, 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 the breakthrough of Habenovitz was the following fact. Well, we know that the closed orbits are, are a critical point of this functional. But this functional. So, so it's like in the, in the case of geodesic flows, right? For, when you want to find the closed geodesic, you take the, you take the energy functional and you want to find the critical point of the energy functional. And in the case of the geodesic flow, it's easy to find this. Okay? Well, essentially easy, right? Because if, why, why? Because the energy functional, in the case of the geodesic flow, is, is well behaved. It satisfies polarized main, it's bounded from below, the Morse index of the critical points is the Morse index are finite, so you can, you can use the classical Morse theory. But unfortunately, this functional is very ill behaved. Okay? It's not bounded from below. The Morse index are typically infinity, so you cannot use classical Morse theory like you do in, in, in for, for geodesic flows. So Habinovitz was the first one that showed that you can do, you can use this functional to find periodic orbits but in a completely non-trivial way, using what the, the so-called mountain pass lemma. He was the first one that showed that this guy is, is, is really useful. Without assuming any condition on sigma. That's the point. More recently, uh, Christophe Gardini and Hutchins and in a, in a joint work with Victor Ginsburg, Doris High, and Umberto Inevix, we prove independently that for the sphere S3, you have at least two. And Liu Long pr also proved this result using a result that in, in our paper, in, in this paper with Ginsburg, High, and Inevix. Okay? So for S3, without any condition, 
you have at least two closed orbits. When sigma is non degenerate, namely that you remember that the, the linear Rice Poincare map does not, have, does not have eigenvalue 1, then it's easy to see that you have at least two periodic orbits in any dimension. Okay. But you see, in general, the, the, the difficult case is the, is the, is the, is the, the, gen, is the, the generate case. And for the elliptical orbit, no general, no general result is known. We don't know if you have at least one elliptical orbit in the general situation. We just don't know. Without assuming any, uh, some generic condition. Okay. So, so, so yes. When you have generic, well, you have the mean and the infinity. So what happens when, okay, because you can approximate any one by a generic. So how do they collapse? Okay. The point is, the, 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 that's the point, right? Because, you, of course, you can approximate, but you, you don't have control of the time, of the, of the period of the, of the orbit. You have no control because you find this, you, have, you find this periodic orbits using, um, sometimes you, you prove this using uh, an, an argument by contradiction. So there is no hope to, to control the, the, the period of the orbits to get something in the limit in general. Okay, now assume now so now let's assume something on the on the on sigma. Suppose that sigma is convex. What it, what does it mean? It means that it bounds a, a strict convex domain. Okay, so it's it's more it's something more restricted. To, so in, in general, we have a star-shaped upper surface, right? But now suppose you have something convex, okay? Then in this situation, the, the results are better. The first result is due to Eklund-Hofer. They prove that in any dimension you have at least two periodic orbits, two simple periodic orbits, in 98.7. And then a very important, very remarkable result the remarkable work of Long Zhu of 2002, they proved that you have at least the floor function of n over 2 plus 1 pediatric coordinates. Wang, which was a, he was a student of Long, improved these bounds when n is odd, getting this, the sailing function of n over 2 plus 1. Okay, so improve by 1 when n is odd. Okay, but you see, in, in, this is a very hard question. So if you improve just by one periodic orbit, it's a very good result. This is very, it's a, in principle, it seems, oh, come on, it's just one periodic orbit. But you're not assuming, it's, it's, it's a gen, you just assume that it's convex. So any improvement just by one periodic orbit is very important. So you will get this improvement uh, when, uh, by one when n is odd. And so you see, when n is four, the, the, previous, the previous inequality gives you three periodic orbits. And, so, and Blank later, uh, in another paper, published in the same year, but uh, he, he, pr he improved this, this, this result in dimension when n is four, okay, getting the, the expected lower bound. Good question. Uh, there are two, two main reasons. First of all, the variational methods in the convex case, in the convex case, are e e the variational methods are easier. Because you see, this functional, in general, is, as I said, is u-behave. But in the convex case, you can replace this functional by some dual functional, which is much more treatable. It's much, 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 it's much better. Okay? And the critical points of this new functional correspond to the critical points of this, uh, co correspond to periodic orbits. And the other thing is that convexity implies some conditions on the index of the periodic orbits, which are very useful to get periodic orbits. These are the two main reasons why the convex case is easier or less hard than the general case. And you because you can go from convex by a small perturbation to something non convex. Well, see, but, uh, co uh, convexity is a C2 open condition. C2 open condition. 
No, it's strict convexity. It's strict convexity. You're assuming strictly convexity. Yes. But that's, a, that's a, the point. It's the variation of methods and the, the, the index of the periodic orbits. And in the non-degenerate case, in the convex case, you can show that the conjecture is true. You have at least any closed orbits. <coughs> but in the non-degenerate case, uh, as I said, the important, the important case is the the generate case is the hardest case. Okay. And what about elliptic orbits? They prove that if you have finitely many periodic orbits, then you have at least one elliptic orbit. In other words, if you have if you don't have elliptic orbits, then you must have infinitely many orbits. It's not a good result, but that's what they proved. Okay, now, okay, so we started with star shaped with something more, something general, and then we restricted to, to, to the convex case. And now we get, impose another, another restriction. Namely, we suppose that sigma is invariant by the antipodal map. So it's convex and symmetric in the sense that it's invariant by the antipodal map. Then it turns out the that the results are much, much better. You can prove that you have at least n closed orbits without any, con uh, only assume that it's symmetric and, 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 and uh, convex without any non degenerate assumption. Okay. And this is due to Liu Long Zhu, okay, the first result. And Dal Antonio Donofrio proved, they proved in 1995 that in this case you get at least one elliptic orbit. Okay, so in the symmetric case, in this convex symmetric case, we do have a positive answer to the ori original question. Okay, now let's think about this convexity, convexity, assumption, convexity assumption, right? Uh, as I said, the, but assuming convexity, you use classical variational, variational methods, and such methods, for this classical variation of methods, you, you need really convexity because, as I said, because in the, convex, in, the, in, the, in the convex case, you can replace the action functional by a good, by a good functional. So you have good variation of methods. But the point is that if you want to generalize these results for more general rib flows, the first thing you, rea you realize is that convexity is not a symplectic condition. It's not a symplectic invariant. You can take a convex hypersurface, and, you can, and it's easy to construct, it's easy to, to see that you can find a symplectomorphism, such a symplectomorphism in R2n, such that the image of this convex guy is not convex anymore. You can see this in, in, in the plane, right? You can take some, you can take a convex a convex re region in the plane, then you can apply some, some symplectomorphism in the plane, which sends this to something, something not convex. So it's not a symplectic condition. So convexity is not a symplectic condition. You are using the affine structure of our, our twin. So a natural question is how to generalize the previous results replacing the hypothesis of, con of convexity by a simplet condition. And, and as I said, this is important to try to, to, to generalize these results to, to more general contact manifolds using fluoromology. What is fluoromology? I will not give details about fluoromology. I will not discuss about fluoromology. I don't have time for this. But remember, this action functional is ill-behaved. Fleur was the first one that Show, show the way to, to, to use, he constructs a Morse, a Morse homology for this action functional. He showed how to, to, how to, 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 to use Morse theory for this functional. So it, it, works in, it works on general sympathetic manifolds. So, so to, to, get, to get a sympathetic condition, it's important if you want to generalize these results for more general contact manifolds. Contact manifolds, okay, for more general rib flows. How to understand convexity from the symplectic point of view? 
And the first definition in this direction is due to Hofer Vizocchi Zender. It's called the dynamic convexity. What is dynamic convexity? Is the f uh, so sigma is called a dynamic convex if every simple periodic orbit has Collins and their index bigger than, or bigger than or equal to n plus 1. Well, I not give you a precise defini defini definition of the Collins and the index, but in the case of closed geodesics, it's the, it's, the, it's the usual Morse index. Okay? I'll not give you that details about this, but the, but the Collins and the index is defined in terms of the linearized Hamiltonian flow along the periodic orbit. Okay? So this is the dynamical convexity. Okay, so every periodic orbit has index at, at least n plus 1. And it's not hard to see that if sigma is convex, it's dynamically convex. Okay? This is the second point that, about your question, what is special in the, in the convex case. One thing that is special is this, is that in the convex case, you have dynamical convexity. Something that, something? Like a picture of something that is not convex, but is dynamically convex. Actually, it's a very good question, and we'll talk about this later. It's a very important question. If there is some example of, of, uh, uh, of uh, a very good question, if there is some example of dynamically convex sphere, which is not symplectomorphic to some convex sphere. This is a very good question. We don't know. Of, of course, you see, of course. Of course, dynamical convexity is invariant by, is invariant by symplectomorphisms. So if you take, if you take some, something convex, then the image can be something that's not convex by some symplectomorphism, but it's, it's dynamically convex. But the question is if there is some example of a dynamically convex sphere that is not given this way by the image of a convex one by a symplectomorphism. This, uh, this is an important question, important and difficult, and difficult question. So clearly, dynamical convexity is a condition variant by symplectomorphism. It depends on it, it's, it's, it's defined in terms of the of the index of the periodic orbit. It is invariant by symplectomorphisms. And and why you have this lower bound n plus one? But well, there is a homological reason for this. I don't want to give you details about this, but essentially, Associated to this, associated to this, to the standard contact sphere, you have the, what we call the contact homology. It's a kind of floor homology for the standard contact sphere, and this is a graded group. The chain complex is generated by the periodic orbits and blah blah blah. And what you can show is that this contact homology is isomorphic to Q. It takes rational coefficients for degrees, the, the, the gradients given by the columns and the index, for degrees n plus 1, n plus 3, and so on, and 0 otherwise. So n plus 1 is the lowest non-trivial <coughs> degree in contact homology for the standard, for the standard, con for the standard contact sphere. Okay. So now assume that sigma is dynamically convex, which is a symplectic condition. What are the results of, for, the, for the lower bound of periodic orbits? The first one is a joint work with Miguel Abreu. We proved that we have at least two periodic orbits in any dimension. It was published in 2007, last year. And there is another result, which is a generalization uh, of the previous result in the convex case due to ginsburg urel the preprint appeared two, two years ago okay but it was it appeared after our um, after my work with with miguel Abreu, that they proved that you have at least n over two, the the sale function of n over two plus one and good can prove that in the non-degenerate case you have at least any periodic orbits and, and with Fabrel, we prove, as in the convex case, that if you have finitely many, then you have at least one elliptic periodic orbit. In, 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 in my work with Fabrel, we actually have results for more general contact manifolds. 
using a more general definition of dynamical convexity, using contact homology, using this, using the contact homology of the corresponding contact manifold. Okay. So we were able to generalize the results for more general contact manifolds, assume some sort of dynamical convexity. Okay, so we have these results. So remember, we, we had results in the star-shaped case, in the convex case, in the, in the convex symmetric case. Now the re now results for in the dy dynamically convex case. So now assume that you have dynamical convexity and that the, the and that sigma is invariant by the antipodal metric, is symmetric, just like in the convex case. But now assuming only dynamical convexity, what we have. We have at least one per elliptic periodic orbit, like in the Antonio Donofrio Eklund, in the, con the convex case. And as before, we proved actually this, we get res this result for more general contact manifolds, assuming some sort of dynamical convexity. And since we are not assuming convexity, the proof. Uh, are not based on classical variational methods. We really need to consider this, this action functional, which is ill behaved. But now we use for homology to do with this, to deal with this. So, okay. So remember, we want to find the lower bound for, for the periodic orbits, for the elliptic periodic orbits. In, assume dynamical convexity and that it's invariant by the tip of the map, then we have at least one elliptic orbit. In the convex case, we, assuming uh, in the convex case, in the symmetric, assuming symmetry and convexity, we also have any periodic orbits. So a natural question is, now suppose that sigma is dynamically convex and symmetric. Is it true that you have at least any periodic orbits, like in the convex case? That's the question. Now we have a sympathetic condition, and, and, and we have the symmetry. The question is if the, if the result in the convex case holds under this assumption that it's dynamically convex. So far, we don't know how to prove this using only dynamical convexity. We need something stronger, a bit stronger. That's what we call strong dynamical convexity. In order to define strong dynamical convexity, I need some uh, normal forms for the eigenvalue one, which are the following. Uh, so you take a sympathetic matrix, suppose that it's totally degenerate. It means that all the eigenvalues are equal to one. Okay? Then you can show that A, this, this, this sympathetic matrix, is given by the exponential of JK, where K is a symmetric matrix with our eigenvalues equal to zero. And you have the, the following uh, normal forms for K. Have four types of K. Okay? K can be the identically zero quadratic form. Can be given by K zero in that, in, in, in that way, when, where D is bigger than or equal to three. Or can be given this way. You have this, uh, sorry, three. Three types of, three normal forms for the eigenvalue one. Okay? And we define B plus minus A as a number of this, the, 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 the of number of Q, of Q plus minus that appear in the normal form. Okay? It's a technical condition, but it's important. Okay? So B plus, mi B plus minus are the number of, of uh, number of times that the third normal form appear for the, mat for the matrix. Okay. And now given a sympathetic matrix, a general sympathetic matrix, and now you take the, 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 the generalized, generalized eigen space of the eigenvalue one, restricted this sympathetic matrix to this, to this guy, and you define B plus minus as 
uh, as, as before with P restricted to, to this generalized, generalized agent space. Okay? Examples, two dimensions. Well, for the identity, of course, the quadratic form is zero. So B plus minus is zero. And for these guys, it depends on the, nipo, on the new potent part. The computation, you can show that in these guys you have this. Okay. And now, given a close orbit, you define B plus minus as the B plus minus of the linear riser Poincaré map. So you see, in particular, B plus minus is zero whenever the periodic orbit is non-degenerate, because it, you don't have a value one. It's, it's not zero only in the, in the, in the, in the generate case. So now what is strong dynamic convex convexity? Suppose that sigma is invariant by the antipodal map. Okay? And, and then, you can, you, then you write the set of simple periodic orbits as the disjoint union of the symmetric orbits and non-symmetric <coughs> orbits. Symmetric means that the orbit the image of the orbit by the antipodal map is the, is the orbit itself and non symmetric if it's not symmetric, if the image is not the orbit. And then we have this definition. We said that sigma is strongly dynamically convex if, if it's dynamically convex in the sense that every periodic orbit, the index of every periodic orbit is at least n, n plus 1. But now we have this. Additional condition, namely that for the symmetric orbits, you have this inequality involving the index and B minus and B plus. And for the non-symmetric orbit, for the non-symmetric orbits, you have the same condition, but only for the second iterate of the orbit. Okay? It's a technical condition, but it's important. And, 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 and again, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the non-degenerate case, it's, it, it's the same as the dynamical convexity. Because in this case, B minus and B plus are both zero. Okay? So in the non-degenerate case... So B plus B minus, minus B plus. B minus, minus B plus. B minus is the number of, of, the, of the Q minus that appear in the oh. normal form. And B plus is the number of Q plus. So and uh, and in, the, in this example, in, the, in the dimension two, you have this. Okay. It depends on the, on the, uh, on the normal form of the eigenvalue one. Okay. It's really important because we are considered the, the generate case, which is the hardest B one. Not really, because you see, depends also depends on the on the index. I agree, huge, yeah. Yeah. Much bigger, yeah. So as I said, as I said, when sigma is non-degenerate, strongly dynamical convexity is equivalent to dynamic convexity because b minus and b plus are both zero. And in general, when the when the eigenvalue one is semi-simple, namely that geometric and algebraic multiplicities are the same, then these conditions, dynamical convexity is equivalent to strong dynamic convexity. Okay? Because in the same simple case, you have the, 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 norm, the, 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 quadra the quadratic form is the zero form. Right? You have the identity. And the strong dynamic convexity is invariant by symptomorphies that commute with the antipodal map. And then we have this result. If sigma is convex and invariant by the antipodal map, then it's strongly dynamic convex. So we realize that convexity implies more than, at least in the symmetric case, convexity implies more than dynamical convexity. You have this slightly stronger condition in the degenerate case. It was a very important point. And then what we prove is this. <coughs> Suppose that you have, you have a symmetric, strongly dynamic convex, convex sphere. Then you have at least n closed orbits.
And uh, actually, we, get, we, we got two results. That one and this one. The second result, we don't need to assume symmetry. Now, instead of assuming symmetry, you assume the following condition. Assume that you have this condition for every simple periodic orbit. Okay? Then you have at least any closed orbits. But notice that this condition is stronger than, than the, the, the first one. Why? Because remember, uh, strong dynamical convexity means that the, the conditions that it's, it's, that it's the, 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 the star is dynamically convex and you need this, this condition for the symmetric orbits and only for the second iterate of the non-symmetric orbits. But here in, 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 the, in the second theorem, we are supposing this condition for every simple periodic orbit. So it's, it's, a, it's a stronger condition. So under this condition, you get at least any orbits. But we, we don't assume symmetry in the second theorem. Okay. So as I said, it's important to mention that the, the hypothesis of theorem 2 possibly is not satisfied when sigma is not convex, when sigma is convex. In fact, uh, it's true in the, linear in the linear level. You can construct a positive symplectic path, which is, which is a it's, it's, it's a candidate of a periodic orbit of a convex sphere that does not satisfy this condition. So pr probably, probably convexity does not imply this condition for every periodic orbit. Okay. And as a corollary of this result, of the, of the second result, as I said, uh, well, you see, when, 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 when the, when the eigenvalue, eigenvalue one is semi-simple, B minus and B plus are both zero. So in particular, we get this corollary. Suppose the sigma is dynamic convex, and the eigenvalue, and, and the eigenvalue one of the linearized Pankaha map is semi-simple. Then you have at least any periodic orbits. So we have the result assuming only dynamical convexity, but we, need to we also need to assume that the eigenvalue one is semi-simple in the non-symmetric case. OK, very good. So, so uh, as I said before, uh, A dynamic convex, a dynamic convex uh, sphere does not need to be convex, right? Because you can take the image of a convex, you, you can take a convex guy and take the image of this convex guy by some symplectomorphism. It does not need to be convex, right? Of course. So, but dynamic convexity is invariant by symplectomorphism. So, so this guy is not, this guy, the image of, of this convex guy by this symplectomorphism is not convex, but it's dynamically convex. Because this guy is dynamically convex, and dynamical convexity is invariant by symplectomorphism. So uh, an important question in symplectic topology is this one. Are there examples of dynamically convex spheres that are not symplectomorphic to convex ones? It's a very important question in symplectic topology. It's a, it's a way, if, 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 for instance, if, it's, if, it's, if every, if, if, uh, if the answer is no, then it's a, it's a, we would get a simplet characterization of, conve of convexity, right? We would get that convexity is equivalent to, to the dynamical convexity, which is a simplet invariant. And we got the following negative, the following positive answer to this question in the symmetric case when n is bigger than 2. We prove the following. Given any, given any bigger than 2, then there exists a symmetric dynamically convex sphere that is not equivalent to a convex one, but is not equivalent by a symplectomorphism that commutes with the antipodal map. We need to assume this, unfortunately. 
So we have a, we have a positive answer to that question, but in the, only in the symmetric case. Assuming, that, uh, assuming also that the symplectomorph is, is symmetric in the sense that it commutes with the antipodal map. In th this case, we have, we have examples of dynamically convex spheres that are not equivalent to convex ones. And how we construct this example, the idea is the following. The example is given by a symmetric dynamic convex that is not strongly dynamic convex. More precisely, in the example, what we have, we have, a, we have a symmetric orbit, we have a symmetric orbit in the example that does not satisfy that condition, have some gamma s symmetric orbit in this example such that That's the point. So we see, in particular, the example is that this orbit is, is, is degenerate. The example is dynamically convex, so the orbit, the orbit does satisfy this condition. So it's dynamically convex, but it does not satisfy, it does not satisfy that condition, that, that condition that this, this, this guy is bigger than or bigger or equal to any plus one. That's the point. And strong dynamical convexity is invariant by symplectomorphies that commute with, anti with the antipodal map. So we get the result. The construction is very technical, okay? But the, the, the point is this: is to find the uh, so we need we need only to find this symmetric we need to find a symmetric orbit satisfying these conditions. But we also need to show that all the other all the other periodic orbits are dynamically convex, namely that all the, other, all the other periodic orbits satisfy this condition. So all the, orbit, all, 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 the, all the periodic orbits satisfy this condition, this condition, but you have a, a special one, a symmetric special one, that, that does not satisfy this condition. That's the point. So summarizing, we have three important questions which are the following. That you have at least any closed orbits, any simple closed orbits, at least one elliptic orbit, and the question convexity versus dynamic convexity. In the, in the symmetric case, we have good results. So for the, first, for the first inequality, we know that it holds under the assumption of strong dynamical convexity. Okay. The second inequality holds for assuming dynamical convexity. And the third, and for the third question, we do have examples of dynamically convex spheres that are not equivalent to convex ones via symplectomorphism that commutes with the antipodal map. So in the symmetric case, these three questions have good results. Not complete, re not complete results, but good results. And in the, the non-symmetric case, things are worse. Okay? We don't know if one and two hold only under the, the assumption of dynamical convexity. Okay? Under, under the assumption of dynamical convexity, we have only for, for, the low, for the number of periodic orbits, we have only that only this, okay, assuming only the dynamical convexity. And we have no lower bound for the, for the number of elliptic orbits, even assuming as dynamical convexity, if you, do, if you are in the non-symmetric case. And we don't know examples of dynamic convex spheres that are not equivalent to convex ones. Okay. Of course, you can ask why the symmetric case is easier or less hard. It turns out that uh, the reasons are different. Okay, uh, we use the, the in the proofs of this 
of these two inequalities, we use the symmetry, we use the symmetry in different ways. I don't have time to, to, to give you details, but they appear, they, we use this in different ways. Okay? There is no common reason why the symmetric case is less hard than the non-symmetric case. And, and, and as I explained before, for the, for the example of dynamic convex, example of a, of a dynamic convex sphere that is not equivalent to a convex one, the point is to construct uh, a symmetric dynamic convex sphere that's not strongly dynamic convex. That's the point. Okay, this is the last slide. And for the directions. Okay, once you. Once we have a simplet condition to get periodic orbits, it's natural, it's natural to, ask to, to, to try to generalize these results for more general real flows. And so uh, future, question, future direction is to extend these results for contact forms, so more general contact manifolds, which are invariant by some special Z2 action, free Z2 action. We already have some partial results in this direction. Okay. And to finish, we have this question. It's a very important question for people in sympathetic, in sympathetic topology. Are there examples of dynamic convex spheres that are not equivalent to convex ones via any symplectomorphism? Because what we got, what we proved is that we got, we, 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 we got examples that cannot be equivalent via symplectomorphism that commutes with the antipodal map. But we have no idea how to improve this result for any symplectomorphism. How to get an example of a dynamic convex sphere that's not equivalent to a convex one. Right. And as I said, it's important to, to, to have a symplectic characterization of convexity. What is convexity from the symplectic point of view? OK, that's all. Thank you very much. Yes, because then in, the, in this case, when you, the restriction of the sympathetic matrix to the, to the generalized at the edge in space is the identity. It's okay, so this is the identity. The so identity. No there is no new potent part, it's just, just the identity. Okay, and this is what makes uh, this equal. Yes. Okay, so what you are doing with this B minus B plus is killing some way or controlling the new potent parts. Yes. Yeah, more precisely, the, the, the way that they appear in the proof, it's related to the, what we call the splitting numbers. It's a, it's a bit technical, but there is a... If you give me one minute, I can try to explain you. There is a construction due to bots. It comes from, the geode from geodesics. Uh, well, for symplectic paths, you have a symplectic path, okay? And then you have a function, which is called the bots function. We have a function defined on the circle such that a function, bots function, taking values in z, integer values, such that this function, it's, it is con it's, it's continuous except, at, except possibly at the eigenvalues of the, of the final point of the symplectic path. Okay? So, uh, so you have these eigenvalues. So in other words, it, the, this function is constant except possibly at the, at the eigenvalues with, with modulus one. So, and this function has the, the following remarkable property, that if you take the index of the kth iterate of the orbit, it's nothing else than when you take the sum of, the, of this function of the k roots of the, of the unity in the circle. So, so these functions are constant except at the eigenvalues. So at these eigenvalues, you have, the, have a jump. You have this, what we call splitting numbers. And this B plus and B minus are related to these splitting numbers. Something technical, but 
This is a very nice construction due to bots.